days ago, Moody's cut its outlook for direct lending funds with ties to BlackRock, KKR, and Oak Tree Capital, lowering them to negative from stable. And my next guest is closely following how private capital is flowing from public markets to private markets. Eric Hirsch is the co-CEO of Hamilton Lane, which is one of the largest private markets investment firms with $900 billion of assets under management and advisory. Eric, thank you for joining. There's a lot of questions here. A lot of money has been moving into those private markets recently. Seemingly, some cracks starting to emerge in private credit, arguably the hottest area right now. What kinds of questions are you getting from investors on how private markets look right now? Chanali, great to be here. Nice to see you. I think your first segment actually really tells the story, which is we're now living in an era where as public equity investors, we're being told concentration is a good thing. Uh, the entire market seemingly driven by a very, very small handful of stocks. And I think that's really the reason why the, in, the sort of retail investor class is beginning to seek some diversification. And so that move away from sort of the public equity, where again, small, highly concentrated, largely indexed asset class, and beginning to move into the private market side. So we've seen huge flows coming there. Now, that doesn't mean that everything is perfect in the private markets. And so on the credit side, you have seen a tremendous amount of capital coming in. It's still finding good homes. Yields continue to be high. But we don't expect to have uniform success across all managers right now. How do you think about this retail investor flow? You kind of hinted at something here that every big asset manager is really looking to capitalize on. BlackRock was just a couple of, Blackstone, I'm sorry, was just a couple of days ago with earnings really pitching that retail product, but in private equity. And private equity has been a complicated space to really handicap lately under a higher interest rate environment. How much demand should there be, frankly, from retail into private equity versus some of these other alternatives? I think if we just step back, I think the question I would ask is, why would the retail investor look radically different than the institutional investor? And today, the institutional investor has a private market allocation anywhere between 10 and 20 percent on average. You see some exceptions on the endowment model, which going north of 30 or 40 percent into the private markets. Yet the retail investor right now is running an allocation that is well below 5 percent. And frankly, a lot of retail investors are sitting exactly at zero. 0%. Now, we also know that over the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years, the outperformance of the private markets versus the public markets has been significant. And so I think that simply has the retail investor asking, hey, why not me? Why am I not sort of experiencing the same benefit that the institutional investors are experiencing? So whether that's in private equity or private credit, I think you're seeing, and that is a big driver of why these fund flows are moving the way they are. You know, let's take devil's advocate for a second to the people who think that getting out of public markets into private markets would help you escape volatility. Because interestingly enough, Eric, we've seen plenty of volatility when it comes to private investments. How do you navigate that? I think there's two pieces to this. I think one is a less liquid asset class. So the move out of publics into privates, you're recognizing that you're changing your view on duration. Now, there's some new technology, there's some new fund structures that are helping to, to mitigate some of that, but there's no question you're going for a longer duration and you're going for less liquidity. As to volatility, I say to investors, they're both equities. They're both gonna be correlated. And so the fact that private markets don't mark on a minute by minute basis and, and mark on a quarterly basis I would say puts in some sort of false muting of volatility, but we should recognize that there's obviously volatility there. It is still an equity strategy. Another thing that we were just talking about a little earlier was that volatility in private credit markets starting to emerge as well. What is the warning sign here? What is the big disclaimer when we're thinking about this movement into private markets? If you think about the environment we're in, potentially higher for longer, uh, potentially higher for much longer for some of these firms, given the credit ratings that they have, how do you kind of avoid the pitfalls? I think one of the big questions is, in the retail world, when you see these fund flows coming into these managers, you have to have real confidence that monthly inflows can be met with good, solid monthly outflows. And I don't mean redemptions, I mean deploying that capital. So I think one of the warning signs that you'd want to look at is our firms sort of seeing their cash balances ballooning, meaning they're taking in more money than they're able to successfully invest in good opportunities. That's one of the things I would keep a close eye on. Where's the biggest opportunity now? Is it really in private credit, as so many people have been talking about it, or is it somewhere else entirely? 
I think it's actually not one thing. I think there is a lot of opportunity in private credit, so I don't think that the sort of fund flows are misguided. I think, again, yields continue to be good. The banks continue to be majorly disintermediated. The private credit managers are filling that gap. And so, and deal flow is beginning to pick up. Deal volume is picking up. Financing needs are picking up. So that continues to look like a very, very solid place. But on the private equity side, we're also seeing, again, deal flow beginning to reemerge. And so I think both sellers and buyers are kind of calibrating to what is the new normal, and we're beginning to see transactions pick up there. I think where you're not seeing a lot of great uh, activity is on sort of uber high growth, non-profitable businesses. More of the private equity capital going for more traditional, well-run, high cash flow, good margin businesses, and we're seeing some nice opportunities there. Hey, Eric, another thing, too, we're just days off of the halving of Bitcoin and a lot of people talking about cryptocurrency assets. When you think about the future of crypto and uh, tokenization, is more of that going to happen on the institutional side, tokenizing traditional assets or more demand coming into traditional crypto assets like Bitcoin, Ethereum, from your view? Shanali, I spend basically zero time thinking about crypto. I spend a lot of time thinking about tokenization. So I would put those two things in two wildly different buckets. To me, tokenization is simply an access tool. It is about using good blockchain technology to provide an easier access methodology for particularly retail investors wanting to access the private markets. So think about taking traditional funds, think about tokenizing them on blockchain so that investors can more easily come and more easily go. Retail investors want things simple, they want things fast, and they want things efficient, no different than they do in every other part of their life, whether it's ordering food or ordering a ride. And so the private markets need to adjust. I think the tokenized uh, way of sort of transacting is going to be the way of the future. I think it will start with the retail investor, and then it will move rapidly to the institutional investor. All about the blockchain. Eric, we thank you so very much. That is Hamilton Lane's co-CEO, Eric Hirsch.